is the Mindset Athlete Podcast, and I'm your host, James Roberts. I'm a two-time Paralympian and owner of James Robert Fitness, which is an online training, nutrition, and mindset coaching business. First of all, I'd like to thank Lauren Williams for suggesting this quote to the show. An athlete is a mindset. It's how you prepare, think, and execute. Not because of some elite status or physical stature. Anybody can be an athlete by Chris Hart. And each week on the Mindset Athlete, we like to bring you inspirational athletes, a message or experts talking about human optimization to teach you how to change your perception of your mindset and become 1% better. And on today's show, I've got Shay Haddo. Shay is an expert coach and speaker on confidence and mindset for female athletes having worked with hundreds of youth female athletes and collegiate teams from across the country. She's empowered girls from all walks of life to strengthen self-belief to play and live confidently. As the founder of Alpha Girl Soccer Academy, host of the Alpha Girl Soccer Podcast and the author of the best-selling book, She the Confident, Shay is widely regarded for her insights on confidence and mindset by parents and coaches around the country. After overcoming her own struggles of self-doubt and lack of confidence, she knew that it was her life's calling to provide female athletes with the coaching that she wished she had. She is dedicating her life to empowering female athletes to uncover their greatest superpower of all, allowing them to break free from the limitations and achieve their biggest dreams. So welcome on the show. Thank you, James. Excited to be here. So obviously... With you being in predominantly being in the US, you were in a kind of a minority sport to begin with. How does that kind of self doubt kind of, uh, how would I word this, present itself? Because obviously it's, it's not a mainstay of be it basketball, uh, American football, and baseball. How does that? put you in kind of self-doubt on the, and kind of been on the back foot from the very get-go? Yeah, and I would say especially being a female in a male-dominated space, I think it's more so that than football being a minority to American football, baseball, and basketball. I would say that that's been the hardest thing for me. Like when I first started coaching at the youth level, I really felt um, – like, like there, I was only one of maybe three female coaches in the club that I worked for. And I had, I did have self doubt that I wasn't good enough because I got paid less than other, than other coaches. And I see it with the girls too. And that's why I do what I do. Cause I want the girls to get rid of their self doubt and have the self belief that it took me a while to get when I was their age. But why is that ultimately that self doubt there, Shay? Because, it, well, not hist- well, historically, the American female team has done better than its male counterpart and kind of punched way above its weight uh, vis a vis because of obviously oh, soccer did have a foothold back in the 80s, lost its popularity, went into the doldrums, and then has reappeared with obviously the MLS. But obviously, mm-hmm. Why do you think that the female portion of the game has been more successful than the males when probably the popularity of the sport has grown similar to, similar, mm-hmm. similarly in uh, eu- euphoria because of the mm-hmm. World Cup you had back in 1994? I think it's grown more for the women's side because for for girls here, like soccer is one of the biggest, most popular sports for, for females. Whereas for males, they're focusing more on basketball, on American football, and on baseball. So I think when, at least for, for what I've realized and I've noticed is boys that start out playing soccer or football, they, they'll play it at a young age, but then it becomes – not cool to do. So then they go focus on the other sports that are predominantly, you know, the majority in America, right? Whereas I think female athletes, soccer is the primary sport or at least one of them. So I think that's why 
female soccer and, and the U.S. women's national team has been so successful here as, as females because that's the main sport that girls play here, or at least one of them, right? So I think that's why there has been a gap between the, women, the women's and the, men, the men's team here is because more girls play the sport than boys. So shouldn't they have more self-belief in themselves to be to kind of progress and be obviously not necessarily progress as a player it could be progress mm-hmm. as a coach because as you know a good player doesn't always make a good coach well they should be more they should not have self doubt but that's how girls are our brains work totally different than boys we are constantly comparing ourselves to other people we overthink things. We want to be well liked. If we do something wrong, we blame ourselves. Whereas boys, they just go out there and play. So the mindset of a, a boy and a girl athlete is totally, totally different. And girls have a lot harder time with their mindset and their confidence because we just overthink everything and we want to be perfect. And I think we have this expectation to be perfect, but it's something that we're never going to live up to. And so I think that's the reason why we're not confident or we have this self-doubt in the sport. And it's not even just for sports. It's for everything in the workplace. I think it's just this expectation of perfection that we will never live up to. But ultimately, it isn't competition to some degree. Obviously, not going to the the realms that we were talking about, perfectionism, that's a bit – that's kind of your overreaching and – I think be it I think male athletes do do it to a certain degree because they're striving towards probably from a youth level to be reaching be it the NBA mm-hmm. the um the NFL just for example sake and the minority that is going to get there is I think a microcosm of everybody that has that belief that they're going to get there so do you think because you're comparing and contrasting against your counterparts that obviously they kind of diminish their own ability. So they obviously, and I'm one one for doing this, so I might have a female character characteristic as in Mm. downplaying the positives and you will fixate solely on the negative. Yeah, absolutely. And like you were saying, like competition is, is absolutely important, right? Like I am one of the most competitive people that I know. But there's a difference between competition and comparison. And girls, like you said, they focus on the negative. They focus on, well, she did this. She's better than me. And they they downplay their own abilities. And they focus on everyone else's, like the good parts of them. And they focus on the negative parts of themselves. So I think that's where the whole comparison things thing comes in. And honestly, like the girls that I've coached, a lot of them don't have that competitive spirit. And I think a lot of it for girls is that they're so worried about, about what other people are going to think of them. And they don't want to be seen as like the bully or they don't want to be seen as bossy. And so they kind of take a step back, even though they may be deep down are very competitive, but they take a step back because they don't want to be disliked by their teammates. Yeah. But And this is, this is at the youth level. But as you know, as you progress, you need to have that killer instinct because you won't progress. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's what I'm trying to teach girls to don't compare yourself, have self-confidence and be competitive. Like if you want to be the best, if you want to have fun, you have to go out there and compete and not worry about what other people think of you. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what other people think of you. Do you think that some female athletes are still living decades in the past as to you need to confine to this stereotype? Absolutely. I mean, obviously the stereotypes aren't as bad as they used to, but they're still there. They're always going to be there. Well, uh, uh, from that, do, do you think it's a bad thing when they, they do it from a, a media perspective as girls or women's, or you soccer or football versus the men's is just called that in itself. Like that's the, it's football and that's it. Do you think that's kind of derogative then? I don't know. I I feel like that's tough. Like for me personally, it doesn't bother me. Um, But I know it bothers a lot of people. So personally, I don't really think it's derogatory. Um, 
for me, it's just kind of like a separator, I guess. Like, but then you could also argue, well, why don't you call it men's soccer and women's soccer, not just soccer and women's soccer. So I see both sides of it. But for me, I personally don't take a lot personally, so it doesn't bother me. Well, I think I think from a personal perspective, I think when, well, well, the World Cup was only just last year. Mm-hmm. I think, well, there was elements, there was cheating that started to come into the game. But before the tournament, they said to the root, to the core of the core values of the, of the sport, it was closer to its origins than saying the man that looking to dive. Uh, obviously, I don't know if it's it's a myth or it's it's just folklore that it's in within people's males contract that you know I need to be able to fall over. Whereas the women's game was a little bit more. Uh, how would I say this? To to the root core, the core, the core value of the game was you know fair play, sportsmanship. Mm-hmm was all there whereas they were probably cut, cutting a fine line between obviously what it's it's competitive so with winning and losing so you you're going to take those marginal gains but do you think that is more from a youth level that it's more from a female perspective it's more it's more grounded in terms of it's it's looking to give the girls and the young women, those attributes that you want to see in society, which we're at the moment we're not, we're starting to not see again in terms of com- camaraderie, uh, sportsmanship, game, not games, because that's cheating. Um, and trying to instill <laughs> that element of fair play where you, you, yes, you want to beat the other person, but you're going to give them the respect that they do. And yeah. They, I mean, they're given. For, yeah. I mean, for sports in general, like, I believe that sports has a great ability to teach, you know, kids a lot of great life skills, leadership, work ethic, like that kind of stuff that can help them. And I feel like it is a little bit more rooted in female athletics and as opposed to male athletics when it comes to the sportsmanship and the fair play and that kind of thing. Why do you, why do you think it's, it shows up more in women's sports than men's? Is it because of there's less ego in it, possibly? I think, yeah, I think ego is a lot of it. And also I think the media plays a big role. Like if you were to take – I feel like the media, if if a woman does something that's maybe not sportsmanlike and a man does the same thing, they're going to bash the woman way more for doing that thing. Whereas for the, for the male athlete, it's just like, oh, you know, that's just part of the sport. But for a female athlete, it's like, oh, like she's – She's got bad sportsmanship. She shouldn't have done that. So I think the media and how they perceive the, you know, what, I guess the, the bad things that happen. I feel like they put more weight on the bad things or they put more focus on female athletes and male athletes when they do something wrong. Do you think they're vilified more then? Um, I don't know if I'd say vilified. But, but I just think that, like, I don't know, even know if, if, if people are aware that it happens, like if they mean to do it, but I just feel like, like I said before, I think it comes down to to the expectation. Like women are expected to be good sportsmanship, to have good sportsmanship, to be nice, to play fair. And on the other side, they don't, I don't think they have the same expectation for male athletes. They should do. They should. But I don't think they do. But do you think it's because it's built, unless this this is going away from sports a little bit, do you think it's because the society as a whole, whether you want to see it or not, is still still stuck in its way of being a bit too chauvinistic then? Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, obviously we've gotten better as far as equality goes, but I think it's, not just sports like you said it's society i think it's just how you know our own our own biases and the media's own biases but coming back to your story now shay why do you think that you had elements of self-doubt and i'm not saying lacking in confidence had lower Mm -hmm. confidence in yourself and your ability where did that come from 
For me, it came from like I got injured when I was 12. I had a surgery on my ACL. I was out for nine months. And so when I came back when I was 13, 14 years old, I was, I think comparison was a big thing for me. But even more than that, I think it was fear of making mistakes, of being yelled at by my coaches, by my dad. So I think that is the biggest thing was I just, I just didn't want to make any mistakes. And whenever I did make a mistake, I just kind of shut down. I didn't know how to respond to mistakes. I think that was the biggest thing for me. How does an athlete return mentally from an injury? Because I was fortunate enough for pro- probably most of my career, if they weren't minor, they weren't that big a deal. They were like just like, how for you because that's a very serious injury, injury in your ACL. As a child. Is it more difficult than, than coming back and say somebody that's maybe professional and being in there? Is it more difficult as a child to come back from injury? I absolutely think yes. I mean, I've, I've had surgery when I was in college too. It wasn't as bad, but for, for a kid, it's like a lot of times they don't have that mindset. They don't understand that they work, that the work that they put in while they're injured, like their physical therapy, that that's going to have a huge impact on on the future of their, their career. Like for me, I didn't put enough, put enough work in and now I can't even bend my knee all the way because I didn't put enough work in when I was 12 years old. But if, but when I was in college and I, I like worked my butt off to get healthier on the field. And, you know, I think, yes, it's that physical, like you got to work hard. I also like the mindset piece of realizing that when you step back onto the field, you're going to be terrified that you're going to get injured again. I was so scared that I was going to get injured again, but just trusting yourself and trusting your body and your doctors that you are ready to get back. And it's going to be a process. You're not going to step back on the field a hundred percent. You may have to change the way you play a little bit, but realize that it's going to take time. It's going to be a process. That's what I wish I would have known when I was injured at 12 years old. And the injury that you you had in college with the same knee then or the, or the other one? Yeah. Same knee, three surgeries on that same knee. And do you think it, it was that much weaker as a result of not doing the work at 12 then, or is that just speculative? No, I think, um, I think if I would have done the work at 12, I think it was more of a mobility thing, more than a strength type thing. Um, I did get my strength back. I lost a lot of speed, but I don't know if there was anything I could have done about that, to be honest. I think because I had my surgery at such a young age, um, you know, I, I, don't, I really don't know why I lost my speed, but I would love to be able to bend my knee all the way. So that's like, I don't really think it affected my play so much, but it affected like little things that I want to do, like kneeling on the ground, right? So yeah. And, and, from a positional perspective, what position did you play then? Center mid. So you needed you needed you needed the pace to be able to because obviously well, you're the w- workhorse mm-hmm. of a team. And actually, before I got hurt, I was I was playing I was playing forward striker, and then I lost a lot of my speed. Right, so I I kind of got moved to the midfield, center midfield, and then I got moved to like center back. And I had to stop relying on my speed so much and I had to learn the game better. I had to learn how to kind of not react but be proactive on the field because I wasn't as fast as everyone else. But that, but having been changed from one position to, the, to another to another, does that not help you as a coach to be able to give a more rounded picture to the, to the coach, uh, to the player, should I say? Because ultimately you've made that transition and most people, myself included, even at school, I always saw it as a negative or you put me in defense because of certain mm-hmm. qualities that, okay, I have a disability, so I, I would be put in defense. But you're putting me back there to take away some of the inabilities that I have. But I think I saw that as one, I did actually see the positive is that, okay, well, uh, I think like futsal, there is no offside and things mm-hmm. like that. So you can use your, the perception of you to an advantage. So I, I think in that one tournament we did play, I played striker. So it's like, well, they're going to have the perception, well, you're disabled. So you're not going to be very good. So, so, so mm-hmm. a long story short, I obviously 
changed a lot of people's perspectives of me based on, uh, well, there's no offside, so I can use that to my advantage. I don't need to use pace. But I think coming back to the earlier yeah. story of school being put in defence, I saw that as a positive because ultimately if I go in defence or, or, or goalie, Mm-hmm. This, the, the agility I can use as my strength and there is no element of pace there is to a certain degree as it has as the sports evolved but what it was those positions wouldn't be have to be as athletic as they probably do have to be now yeah I think that kids when they get moved around they do see it as like something they're like, oh man, I'm not good enough for the forward or I'm not fast enough or whatever it is. But when you look at it, it's like the more positions you can play, the more versatile you are, the more versatile you are, the more valuable you are to the team. Like you should want to be that player that your coach can literally stick anywhere on the pitch to play whatever position is needed, right? Like for, for the U S women's team, it's like crystal Dunn is the most versatile player on the team. She can, Rocket at playing defense, and then she can also do the same thing playing forward. So being versatile and learning how to play other positions is only going to make you a more skilled player and also a smarter player because you know the responsibilities and the roles of each position. But I think ultimately, would it be in a Euro- well, predominantly European game, and it's mm. built around defense most of the time. But I think it has probably taken some of the American stereotypes from the sport for us to be more offensive so it's more entertaining to watch mm-hmm. obviously VR aside that I think ultimately well it's it's still up in the air and when, when that season is going to start again in, in multiple countries but I think we were the only one to be it was kind of going the opposite where everybody else would be awarding more offensive play with technology in the UK, we seem to be going the opposite way as to we'll take it, we'll chop this goal off for like millimeters. It's like, well, if it wasn't for the camera, that's not offside. But I think what you talked about there, Shay, in terms of the overall versatility of a player, I think is quite nice because I think if you can look at a positive like that, that that's you, it doesn't matter if you come off the bench, you are as uh, the New Zealanders do with their rugby, it's like impact players. It's like you might be the the first person off the bench, but if you're as good as the person starting from, okay, mm-hmm. we're talking the top end of the, of the sport now, that has a massive impact because that person is fresh and they're virtually as good as the player that they're replacing. So if you are able to look at it like that, you take advantage of, of people that have been on the field, be it, for argument's sake, 80 minutes already, you're fresh. You go, you can take advantage mm-hmm. of any little slip up they make. Bang. You, 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 it doesn't matter if you're a midfielder, uh, defender coming off the bench or a corner or a striker, you take advantage of that little slip up and it could be a, a, that one mistake, that one player made in that tie game. Mm-hmm. Exactly. A lot of times those players that sit on the bench to start the game, like they don't realize how big of an impact they can have when they come on the field if they come on with high energy, like a lot of times, especially for youth, they're like, they see it as a bad thing that they're a bench player and then they get on the field and they don't realize like, if I go out there hundred percent, I can really like change the tempo of the game. So I think it like, I think it was Anson Dorrance um, that said like, they're not bench players, they're game changers or impact players. I can't remember exactly what he said, but like they're, they literally, they change the game. You know, when they step on the field with that, those fresh legs, legs, like you said. Well, it's an ego trip. And I think you've been there. Mm. I've definitely been yeah. there. It's like, yeah. it's like, what? I'm, I'm on the bench, but I'm better mm. than this person. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I've been there for sure. Yeah. But I think, I think this is where you won't, obviously, for your kids, may not, they might not start doing it. This is where I think I would implore people listening. But this is where you've got to speak to the coach as to where can I get better? And they will tell you exactly A, B, C, D. This is what you're doing right now. This is where you can actually help the team get better. And you put your ego aside and kind of say, well, okay, am I doing X, Y, Z? Mm -hmm. And ultimately, if the answer is no, it takes 
a lot of guts to probably have to do that because most people Absolutely. won't want it. it's like well I'm going to approach a player uh, approach the coach and and ask where am I falling short it takes mm-hmm. a bit bigger person to be able to do that and obviously you can do that at a younger age that mentality mm-hmm. switches very very quickly and you, you see the positive like we were talking about and you probably leap and you and I definitely we talk about psychology 10 15 years ago it was not wishy-washy but it's like woo-woo stuff it's like nah that's not important Mm -hmm. it's the physical and and the 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 diet and that's it the mind is not important I control the mind if I'm in a head a positive headspace I'm in control but I think and this is where people say to me I I like your positive energy and I'd like to be a carbon this isn't their words but I would like to be a carbon copy of you it's like you don't want to be a robot you don't want to be me yes there's attributes of me that you can find within yourself and that's a, 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 what we're talking about in terms of leveling leveling up that that level of confidence you have in your your own ability in yourself you don't want to be you don't want to be me I I I, I was talking to a client last week about it it's like you mm-hmm. you, you show the good the bad and the indifference like no I don't I show the good I sometimes get more vulnerable but there's certain mm-hmm. aspects of my life I, I I'm either not comfortable that you can either deal with as a society mm-hmm. or I'm not comfortable yet to be able to unwrap and kind of expose myself to that side which I think everybody is to a certain extent like that so I think yeah. people need to be a little bit more vulnerable and, and approach their coach and say well can I get better obviously probably you did at a collegiate level because it's it's trying to get to the professional level mm. you're more inclined to well ask questions because you're in that kind of environment anyway it, within uh, the collegiate environment yeah I mean well that's something that I teach I don't care how old you are I I teach that to my players to go talk to their coach when they want to get better when they want to get more playing time, because it's just a good skill to develop to number one, improve your communication skills, but number two, like be okay being vulnerable and be okay, like speaking to authority. Right. And I think that communication can solve a lot of problems, whether it's communication between teammates or coaches and parents or parents and and kid. Um, So I always say, always say if, if you want something to change, you have to make it known. You have to communicate it or it's not going to happen. Do you think that's a, a learned behavior or it, it's something that you can, um, you're can you born with? Ultimately, that com- the communication in, in, from a sport perspective, because obviously you've got to be fairly vocal on a football or soccer field anyway, no matter what position. And, and I'll give some, some perspective to people for me. I obviously went from an individual sport to team sport and I had to learn that. So it's like mm. you can kind of hide away in, a t- in an individual sport or having one other individual kind of say, well, the only person that has to hear me is the person in front of me. Or whereas team, they're kind of, well, James, you need to emphasize your voice so people can hear you. It's like, well, and this is maybe where I should have probably said to them, well, that's, I've never had to do that. I've never had to say my ball or something like that mm. or, Right. I, I could I could kind of go well as long as it's a command and the other person can hear me. It doesn't matter how softly uh, tone uh, it be. Whereas when you go into a team sport, you got to project your voice a little bit more to, and kind of be coming back to what you point you said earlier in the episode of um, girls questioning themselves on that. Do you think they some females or, or, or girls? from a perspective they feel that they can't be that kind of machismo or, or kind of bullyish tone what what it what it did because obviously if you, you you do it enough that's intimidating for somebody else yeah well obviously i think definitely communication is learned but i think there are communication styles i think they can be changed but i think our communication styles are kind of what we're born with as far as like me personally, I'm not very loud. If I try to yell across the field, no one's going to hear me. 
Um, so my communication style is a lot different, but I've had to learn to communicate and how to communicate differently. So, and I, and to your last point about like, yes, I think girls are afraid of being too loud or being too boisterous or whatever it is, even though that may be their personality. But I think our personalities dictate our communication styles. So yes, you can always get better at communication, but don't try to communicate in a way that doesn't reflect your personality. And do you think from, from you talk about communication, this is where your sport is probably more, the most difficult in terms of being able to, uh, you've got to be very ingenuitive in terms of getting messages on the feet. Obviously at the young age, it's not, it's not as such as important, but be it, but if we think of basketball, American football is always stopping play. So to be able to get messages on the, on the field, obviously American football with the, with the earpiece in the helmet. But other than that, there's stoppages in play that you can, the coach can have more of an impact, uh, uh, more, uh, quick instances than, than, than the only time you're going to get a stoppage in play is maybe half time, very serious injury mm. or when they've, brought in you know uh, because of inclement on weather so be it they're probably water breaks right. so that's the only time that you're seeing the coach can kind of say, well when well, this is this whatever scheme system that we're playing isn't working we need to change it to to whatever formation to be able to capitalize what whatever the opponent's doing but from a youth perspective how do you kind of adapt your style of coaching from going from a training environment or practice mm-hmm. environment to then games? Because obviously you have more control on one aspect compared to the other. Yeah. So for me personally, since I don't yell a lot, I can't reach my voice across the field. It's really about the stoppages and when players come out. So this, so before we start the game, it's like, okay, here's what the game plan is. Like really nail that down. And then when players come out, I'll use them as messengers sometimes. So whether it's they specifically need something to work on or maybe I need to shift things a little bit on the field, shift a formation, whatever it is, when I have a player come out, I'll coach them on it and then they'll kind of go and shift things around on the field when they get back on the field if I can't personally communicate it to everyone, you know, especially the people on the far side. like They're like, what? I don't know what you're saying. So that's how I've done it is using the player's when they come out to make a lot of different coaching changes. And then, like you said, halftime, it's like you got in a youth game halftime, what you got five minutes to make any adjustments and, and, you know, talk to the team or talk to individuals to make the necessary changes. So for me, coaching games was, it was a little bit tougher because a lot of other coaches I coached against, they could just yell across the field and make those changes. But for me, number one, I didn't want to. And number two, like I couldn't. So I had to adjust my communication style on on the field. But coaching at a youth level, you talk about, you know, shouting across the field and now coming to the child themselves. If they don't respond well to that change in voice tone now, because obviously you've got to uh, project the voice a long way. With your style of coaching, do you see it more more difficult, more challenging coaching at a youth level versus where you were at the collegiate level that pe- people are gonna the, co- the coach got a little bit longer time to get to know you so thus can get your get to know the personality and the style in which you respond so do you think it's more difficult coaching at the youth level um in a sense like you said because you don't know them as well as a person and how they respond to communication but for me no because I am really 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 good with kids And I know how to communicate with kids. I know how they like to be talked to. So personally for me, I don't think so. I think it would actually, I don't think it would be harder at the collegiate level because I've done both. Um, And I just kind of change my communication style to both. But I feel like I'm very adaptable in the way that I communicate to a 12-year-old versus an 18-year-old or a 20-year-old. Would you get more fulfillment out of them? Obviously, that's a difficult question. That is a difficult question. Um, I guess from my experience alone, I would say the youth level. Um, but yeah, I think I just have more fun at the youth level. 
because I, I can be more fun and I can be more silly. And I feel like at the higher collegiate level, yes, I could be myself, but also I had to be a lot more strict and, you know, communicate in a different way. So that is like, I do enjoy that as well. But I think as far as fulfillment goes, I would say the youth level. You think because of ultimately the youth level being so closely to be recreational or like you were talking about happiness and enjoyment, do you think obviously because you, you can bring the element of fun, uh, obviously there's probably a competitive element in it with the US. I know they've changed it over here that it doesn't count, whereas that brings its own little difficulties, whereas that, okay, that, it doesn't there's no winning and losing so ultimately some people don't get hurt whereas the ones that are winning all the time well what's the point because I'm, I'm winning i'm not getting any benefit from that but it also i think from from uh probably going forward it doesn't still it doesn't instill to anybody winning and losing mentality as, as that's how life works you've got to there's got to be a winner and there's got to be a loser so to take that away probably diminishes a little bit of um, the aspect of where life's going to take you. And ultimately that's an argument in itself and a bit of a tangent for everybody Mm -hmm. and everybody will be on one side of the fence or the other. But from your basis, do you think having that fun element, the happiness is a good thing because ultimately as long for as long a period of time as they can enjoy the sport, is is the is the better better for it because ultimately um it is time to hang up the boots obviously when you don't enjoy any sport right i mean like yeah the most important thing for kids is to have fun but i don't think that you either can have fun or you can be competitive i think you can have both um i know you can have both and i believe that both are extremely important um but yeah like you said when you don't have fun anymore like there's no point. And for me, like my goal is to keep as many girls playing and having fun as I possibly can. Like, because I know that soccer and sports in general has so much to offer a female athlete with improving their confidence and their leadership, like we talked about earlier. So my ultimate goal is to, to teach them how to enjoy the sport while also being good at it. Because that too is like when you have fun, usually you play better. When you play better, you have fun, right? And so it kind of all ties together. But how do you keep, and this is a difficult question now, Shay, both happiness at a certain level, of, and people can't see my hands, but keeping up at a constant level, uh, at the same level of happiness and competitiveness, because ultimately if somebody is, for whatever reason, diminished in that because they're not playing well or they're benched or they feel that they're better than somebody else that's obviously their confidence and self self doubt is going to creep in so how do you kind of keep an even kill with both of them and kind of get people to be adaptable to kind of well i'm not starting today so what do i need to do to keep my competitive level up but i'm still happy that I'm in a, I'm in the team. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think at an individual level, the more confident you are, then the more you will enjoy the game while also being competitive. So I think that the solution for that at an individual level is confidence is self-belief, right? Because like I just said, if you're confident then you're going to have fun, if you're confident, you're going to be able to take, getting benched or getting feedback or getting criticized, right? Which allows for the competitive piece. But as like an organizational or a coaching perspective, it is hard. It's, it, you got to have a, a balance of pushing the kids um, and pushing them to compete and pushing them to get better and making each other better. But you also can't do it in a way that diminishes or embarrasses people. And it's hard because there is, I think, such a fine line between competitiveness and comparison. So I think it's finding the, hey, let's be competitive, but we don't need to compare ourselves, which again, I think it comes down to competitiveness is 
Um, not necessarily egotistical, but comparison is. That's very, that's very true. But do you think there is an element of egotis, egotism to get to be competitive? Because this is where, from the outside perspective, looking in into the sporting bubble, people or society view sportsmen and women as very self-centered and selfish. Yeah, I mean, I think there obviously is the ego is involved with competition. I think the ego is involved with everything that we all do. I don't think there's many people in the world that don't have an ego. We obviously all have an ego, but there's not many people in the world that don't let their ego um, affect what they're doing. So the ego is a huge part of what we do. But I think when it comes to competition versus comparison, competition is, is I think like wanting to do better in the positive side of it. Whereas comparison is like, I just want to do better so that I don't look bad. So when you coming back from injury, you were more, you were more worried about being compared to the player you were before the injury. And as well as once you've come back, if I make a mistake, they're going to compare me. See in your head, ultimately, mm-hmm. this is where the problem is. Yeah. Versus my my peers. Do you think that's where the problem was? That like, you were twelve. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think that's where the problem is at for a lot of kids. It's crazy how how many girls I work with, and when I ask them, like, what are your your negative thoughts or your limiting beliefs, and probably eighty percent of them, like every single time, will say, "I'm not as good as her," or "I'm not good enough." And that's a, that's comparison, not good enough for what, or I'm not good as good as her, or I'll never be as good as her. Yeah, but ultimately, oh, this is where it's not self-talk, but be you know motivational mm-hmm. quotes. I think the best one is uh, with I think it's with like a mind on it, and obviously you've got to put yet ultimately. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Did right. I did I think I was going to be the sports person that I became at? that age I had the belief that that's what I want to do did I have the Mm -hmm. realism that it was going to come true no I think 15 16 where we were kind of saying well this is a possibility Mm -hmm. okay this door is slightly ajar let me open it uh, and see where it takes me whereas I think you you talk of, of the comparison I think as adults we're very uh, easily swayed to the comparison because be it for the aesthetical appearance, um, wealth, mm-hmm. and all things like that are, that are very negative. We don't want to be very supportive of each other. So it's like, well, kids are all right. The kids are okay with um, being supportive of one another for the greater good. What 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 aspects do we learn from each other growing up that we go away from that? So it's like, well, why are we going towards jealousy and envy where we're quite content that ling- uh, being at the same? I'm going to use mm. this loosely because it's te- probably technically not true. Being at the same level as kids, obviously, there's so going to be people that are slightly better than you, yeah. slightly worse than you, and you'll be maybe center ground. But you're content with okay. As you can com- get more competitive, oh, I want to be as good as them. I want to stay better than this group, but I don't need to compare. And I think for me, I've it, it's. It, I think it is that internal dialogue you have to have with you, yourself because ultimately, people will say that they lack that motivation. It's like, well, that's not true. You're not lacking in any, uh, be it confidence, motivation, belief. You've got to a certain level. You, you've got to show up every day and put in the work. Nobody's putting a gun, nobody's putting a metaphorical gun to your head to kind of say, mm-hmm. well, you need to do this. I think that mm-hmm. is the difference between Joe Blogs on the street. And the athletes that do progress, it's like, well, yeah. you want to show up, you want to do it. It brings you 
that happiness that you talked about, Shay, in terms of it, 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 it brings not a wholeness, but it's a part of you where you feel kind of free to be able to express yourself, be it, okay, midfield is a little bit easier to do it because it's like painting mm-hmm. on a canvas to be spray book passes around everywhere uh, and setting people up from that basis. Whereas I think when you say comparison, if you can make a positive spin on it as to be competitive, yeah. be it, mm-hmm. I don't know who your role model was for you growing up, be it a lot of kids have got historically be like Kobe Bryant or Michael Jordan, mm-hmm. no, matter, no matter what their sport is, they want to emulate their role models. So it's like, well, right. if you can use the comparison to mm-hmm. you don't want, and, and be it quote, Kobe before before he died he didn't want to be the next Michael Jordan he wanted to be the next Kobe Bryant he wanted to be right. his own in his own image so I think if athletes are listening to that it's like you you've got it's going to waver the motivation and the confidence because we are human beings and we've got to remember mm-hmm. that we're not we're not robots obviously athletes you might be included but I know for me I lost sight of that and I became very robotic for long periods of my career and it's like well did you really truly soak in that moment it's like Mm -hmm. I've got memories be it in my head pictures but did I really truly soak up that moment in time I probably didn't so it's like Mm -hmm. it's not a regret because I can't do anything about it but I could have made a better light of that situation in terms of kind of experiencing every fleeting moment because it was it could be gone. Like you, you say you had an ACL injury that could have been your, mm-hmm. your career done exactly there, there and then. So I think the athletes, yes, you need to sometimes be robotic because that's where we put the hours in and that's where the repetition mm-hmm. comes into place where it's easy to kind of yep. recall back to it, but you need to enjoy that moment because you don't know whenever it's going to be your last. Exactly. It's about enjoying the process. Right. If you don't enjoy the process, you're going to, you're never going to make it to your so-called destination. And is there really a destination? I don't know. I think life's total. There is no destination. Life, there's no destination in life. It's just your journey. So you have to find the motivation, whatever it is to continue on your journey and do it in a fulfilled way. Because if you're not fulfilled, you're not going to keep keep grinding or whatever it is that you're doing well i think that goes nicely in terms of what you talked about earlier in terms of perfectionism people Mm -hmm. deem that their result goal or target is perfection yeah Yeah, but as an athlete you know that's not gonna that's not true yes we have ultimately a national championship uh championship game or whatever sport you play that is the target to peak for that specific, specific moment in time. But you still got to enjoy the process in terms of, yes, there's going to be elements of, of practice or training that you don't like. And obviously they, you go through them, not through the motions, but you mm-hmm. grind through it anyway, because ultimately you'll still iron up that specific end of the the rainbow kind of aspect whereas I think you need to probably defer from that in terms of enjoy every ounce of the process because ultimately which do you enjoy more the process or the result because if you don't win you will not you will not enjoy the result uh and you will probably did you will probably look back as coming back to Mm -hmm. the the confidence and self-doubt the what ifs and that's mm-hmm. a whole beast, another beast in itself, because it's you're going to beat yourself up as well. Did I do enough? And ultimately, if you know deep down, kind of going it in and out and enjoying every day as it comes, yeah. you actually can. Well, did I do enough today? Yes. Did I bring the best version of myself today? Yes. I think win or lose. Mm-hmm. nobody likes to lose but I think you can rest in assured in yourself that I did the best I could 
I, I, I showed up every day. I gave every ounce of sweat that I could. I couldn't do anything more. The other person, the other team was just better on the day. Yeah. And that's the thing is when you don't do that and you lose, there's no worse feeling in the world feeling that you didn't give it your all and then you lost. And then it's just regret. And that's, there's no, not many worse feelings in the world than regret. You know, so it is about like every time you step on the field, you never know if it's going to be the last time you step on the field. One day it will be the last. You don't know when that day is going to be. So enjoy the process while you're there. And when you get to your so-called destination, realize that you're just going to have to keep starting over again. Once you get to your destination, there's going to be another destination and another and another. So it's a continuous journey. I think also, Shay, it is, and I don't know if you and I, never in terms of maybe you might a journal but from a sports perspective you never journal in terms of um they talk about you know the 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 peak and the mountain be, motivation is very upwards to, but then because you don't write it down you forget how you did it so i think if you can enjoy the process write it down as all the steps that you actually did yeah you've got something to go back on oh that's what i did as to this is how I got to level two. This, this is mm-hmm. how I'm going to have to do to get to level three, but obviously I'm going to have to put a little bit more effort into it to be able to get to the to the next level. And I think you do probably forget certain aspects. It's like, well, okay, be it um, from a, well, me being a coach as well, but in a different field, I have to remember as well, what attributes can I take from sport to put into business? And and there are crossovers and you talked about competition. That's one that needn't, it does rear its ugly head occasionally. And, and it's mm-hmm. more, it's not competition as I put it, it's more comparison as to what, what is, what is somebody else yep. doing? Why are they succeeding more than I am? But I think where people have to take sense of this, it's like, well, they're on a different, they're on another journey. They could be, mm-hmm. Exactly. On a to completely different track from where you're at, and they're kind of living their own struggles uh, mm-hmm. uh, versus your own. You're on, I don't know, we we'll use the level example again. I'm on level two, you're on level three, but you're living the same scenarios in your own head as well. I'm seeing somebody right. now level four, and they're, they're de- whereas it's if you can get out your own way, mm-hmm. which is across the board, doesn't matter, sport, life. Uh, and this is one I'm reading like in The Big Leap. We like to self-sabotage ourselves any way we can. Mm-hmm. If we're going to get too much, much happiness, what can I do to be destructive to, 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 to bring me back into comfort? Where it's like, well, why do we do this? Because we thousands and thousands of years ago we were in we lived in uncomfortable situations it was, every day was life or death so you're thinking well why does the cortex work that way that it can tear us down but it can't mm-hmm. give us solutions as well obviously the we we only use i think what was 80 percent of the brain anyway so there's that 20 percent mm-hmm. that probably some people more than others can tap into and you are a level above everywhere else in terms of that ability to slow things down in sport and kind of see it before it happens is is a skill in itself and that's something you can you can aspire to have absolutely yeah that's the thing is like we have to realize that we're all on different journeys like you said and maybe this girl started five months before you five years before you and yeah, you see all the good thing that's happening, but in the world we live in now, you, you like the person can only, they only want to post the highlights of their life. They only want you to see what they want you to see. You don't see the bad stuff they're going through, the, the things behind the scenes. You don't see the work they're putting in. So it's like, you're only comparing yourself on a superficial level. You don't really know what they're doing. So you can't compare yourself because you're on totally different paths and journeys. 
But why does an athlete do it in the first place to compare themselves to? It's the next, uh, and be it, I will use myself because it's easier. Because I, I know the external shouldn't be a motivator because it's about rewards, awards, praise, mm. and things like that. Versus the what is it? The positive of the reward that you will get by accomplishing it. You would think that would be just that, that would be enough, but just to 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 drive you a little bit. But obviously, other athletes are mm. coming back to Kobe Bryant before he passed. He was ruthless. He's like, he's like, well, you are borderline, probably. Um, what's the one I want to use? It's almost psychopathic in terms of from a sports. Mm. You're that ruthless. You uh, would not but an eyelid in terms of you're going to, it doesn't matter. And his work ethic, you're thinking you're crazy. It's like obviously training for, for games, uh, obviously you want to get better. You mm-hmm. need to be doing whatever it takes to be better than the next individual. Yes. But most people aren't hardwired like that. No, and that's why he got to where he was, and that's why MJ got to where he was, and that's why the rest of the 99% of the world is where they are. Is I don't know. It's I don't know what it was inside of them, but I don't know. They they had it, whatever it is. Do you think with Michael Jordan per se being cut would be the the um, the trigger? Because ultimately. Mm-hmm. Myself Maybe, included, yeah. you have a chip on your shoulder where when people say you mm-hmm. can't achieve that, I obviously yeah. changed my 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 mantra later on in life. Says that's not a good thing because that's an external motivator. Uh, yes, yes, I have a chip on my shoulder. However, um, what I kind of get people to do now is I I don't live in the past. Whatever you say, I learn from back then. I might relive it, but I'm not, I'm not content with staying there. That's happened. It's their, their pictures, their memories. It's, 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 uh, still ultimately me, mm-hmm. but I'm not going to stay there. I'm, I'm content with where I'm at in the present and kind of go forward. But do you think from your perspective, your opinion on personal opinion, Shay, that that's probably what's setting them up for, for life in terms of, okay, I'm never going to be cut from a team ever again. Yeah, I think it was, like you said, an external driver, maybe, um, where it's like he hated that feeling so much and had something to prove, whether it's proof to himself or proof to the world. But, you know, I think a lot of people can do that and it can destroy them. Um, But if you have the right mindset, I think it can fuel you like it did MJ or Kobe or whoever it was. But So uh, the last question then on that note then, Shay. If you have to summarize what we've been speaking about today into one sentence for people to take away, what would that be? Well, we talked about comparison a lot. So I'm going to go like, don't compare yourself to other people. Compare yourself to who you were yesterday and be better than you were the day before. I think that's a great one to leave, leave on. So once again, Shay, thanks again for coming on the Mindset Athlete Podcast. Thank you, James. I appreciate it. And I enjoyed the conversation. So thank you again for having me. Oh, it's my pleasure. If you like this episode, please do share it with your friends and do let Shay and I know what you thought of the episode by tagging us over on Instagram at Shay Hadu. So that's S-H-A-Y-H-A-D-D-O-W and at James O. Roberts 11. And again, you can do the same on Twitter and Facebook. And in addition, if you had any additional questions, don't hesitate to shoot them over as well. And finally, don't forget to check out her website at www.alphagirlonline.com and on Instagram at alphagirlsoccer. And as always, don't forget to check out my free content at fitamputee.co.uk and click on the tab resources. But not forgetting, I've also started a new Facebook group, especially for the podcast, which you can find by typing in The Mindset Athlete.
And last but not least, and one especially for the amputees listening to this show, I've recently created a Facebook group called The Amputee Coach, fitness and nutrition for amputees to help you lose 10 plus pounds. So make sure to check those links out. They will be in the description. You can find all the show notes at mindsetgame.lipson.com under the category general. So once again, thanks for listening and I'll catch you next week for another episode of the Mindset Athlete Podcast.